Good evening, and welcome to Tinker Tailor Solder Fry here on the Mighty Loading Ready Live Video Entertainment Network. I'm Ian, your host, and today I've brought the boss in. It's Paul. Hey, everybody. Yeah, and we're going to be uh, working on a little project together. This is something you've been uh, tinkering with for the past few weeks now. Yeah, well, technically, I've been really tinkering. I was tinkering with this, like, for a while, mm. a little while ago. And then it was one of those things that I sort of like, oh, that's kind of interesting, and then kind of put on the shelf. <laughs> and I was like, that would be cool for maybe a Tinker Tailor at some point. Yeah. So to give a little background, we've uh, what we're talking about is these little Wemos D1 Minis, which are a... Uh... Can we do like a... Yeah. <laughs> oh, did I? I'm a dumb. Yeah. They're just a little... Uh, they're, they're a uh, development board for the ESP8266 uh, system on a chip package, which... Which is, the, the actual ESP part, I guess, is the little the little bit there, right? Yeah. yeah there and then there's just it, some extra stuff to make yeah, it a little like easier. The development board gives you a, 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 like a, a, a serial to USB uh, thing to allow you to flash these things and some protection circuit and easy to attach holes, but they're super cool. They allow you to do so many different things that it's... What I love about, like, I was, you know, I did some sort of reading about these things, and I love the idea, like, this this little, so this this thing, the ESP8266, uh, mm -hmm. is a chip that came out a few years ago, mm -hmm. uh, basically as a Wi-Fi chip for Arduinos, <laughs> <laughs> like, was the idea, was that it was, like, the special, you know, it was a, a really low-cost Wi-Fi chip. For an Arduino, yeah, and then there's all sorts of information that came out with it about how to attach it to your. Because previously, Arduinos, you had to have like a sh separate shield to add Wi-Fi capabilities to it. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Oh, as people are, are, are mashing in the chat there, yeah, these were the basis for last year's Desert Bus, the button. Yeah, and what happened is as people started actually like getting their hands on these things and messing with it, they were like. Why do we, why do we need to actually connect this to an Arduino? I mean, yeah. sure, there's a lot of stuff that you can do if you attach it to an Arduino, but the thing by itself, Wi-Fi requires that it has a certain amount of processor power, a certain amount of RAM and and memory, and all the things that you need. We don't need to attach it to anything. Yeah. We can just use the chip. <laughs> like this is a Wi-Fi chip, but it just has all these other the, this stuff that they're like, hey, wait, we can just. We can just put stuff directly onto the Wi-Fi chip and use it that way. All the direct, all the, uh, all the things you need right there on chip. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know the, the the number one thing that I think makes these extremely popular. How much do you think you'd pay for such, such? <laughs> How much would functionality? you pay? Well, the point is, it's single digit numbers, depending yeah. on where you get them and in what quantity. You 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 will be hard pressed to actually find these probably above the five to seven dollar range. Yeah, which is just, yeah, just crazy. You know the the. The, how far things have dropped in terms of democratizing yeah. the... Uh, I mean, uh, they've got enough power on them that they can run their own little web server. Yeah, and yeah. That, to think that you can do that to uh, to 12-year-old Ian, who was just getting on the internet for the first time with a dial-up modem, would be blown away. Yeah, like I mean, of course, these days, you know, five bucks for one of these... 15 bucks for like a Pi Zero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. We're kind you of know, the, 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 we are, uh, uh, our cup runneth over with little teeny weeny computers. It's not, not, uh, not star for things. Yes, Nova Girl, we are still sticking with the pink for the, uh, for the 3D printer. So I should point out. So the reason the 3D printer here is here today is because, uh, this is going to be going to be a test to see how much noise it actually makes in a streaming environment. <laughs> <laughs> but also, Paul figured we should uh, we should have a case for it too. And yeah. uh, as you all know at home, I or hopefully know, I, I run a Hackintosh and decided to upgrade to Mojave 10.14.4 yesterday, without upgrading Clover, which means my computer won't boot right now. Which means I couldn't print one out last night. So we're going to do that today. I will do it sort of a two for one there. So yeah, thanks again, Nova Girl, for sending the uh, the three D printer to us. It's been of very good use so far, and uh, now that I've actually now you know why all of the uh, dance party buttons were pink. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I've uh, if we want to swap it over to quickly the uh, the picture in picture there, I've got my Thingiverse account here, and I've uh, grabbed a few uh, few Wemo. So you can tell this is a pretty popular uh, chip package. Mm. Because there are a number of uh, 
of interesting Different matches. little cases you could make for yeah, it. And yeah, I, I think I'm going to choose one here that I think we'll be able to actually get printed during the show itself. Mm. So I'll go with this one. It looks good. Uh, you know, we can. it just slips in there and clicks into place, which will be super handy. So we'll download the file, and then we just open that up and find the file. Drag that to the desktop. There, there we go. And uh, then before you can actually print these things out, for those of you who do not know, you need to slice the uh, slice each of your your files into a a sliced file. And basically, yeah, what the, it's, it's how a three D printer so it lays down things and yeah, it's kind of like a software mandolin. It uh, converts your uh, <laughs> your your three D yeah, model yeah. into the appropriately heighted uh, slices that it will lay down there. Uh, that'll take a few seconds to get up. So. Uh, well, why don't we walk us through the idea of what, what, we ha what we're trying to do here today. So this is, uh, I, I was saying to Ian yesterday, in some ways this is uh, a, the end result of a series of um, com compromises, <laughs> which is to say, so I originally had this idea where the, you know, the, the cameras that we use uh, m primarily here in the studio are these uh, Blackmagic studio cameras which um, are quite nice. And one of the neat things about them is they have a full, um, they, they have a, a remote control system through uh, their SDI port. So, you know, lots of cameras have SDI output. These cameras also have SDI input. And when you attach that to a uh, Blackmagic ATEM, which is the, I, forget, I don't even know what ATEM stands for, but it's the, <laughs> it's the, a special piece of hardware that allows you to do switching and all sorts of stuff. When you connect those two, and then uh, basically you get the equivalent of a um, like a, an editing or, or a, a, a switching console, uh, but in a digital form. So you can um, not only switch between cameras, but you can actually go into each camera and like set the white balance of the camera, set you know focus it, uh, uh, set the um, iris, you know, the brightness of the camera, all sorts of fun stuff like that. And so I had this thought that rather than running all these SDI cables everywhere, uh, and in particular the camera that's, uh, the, the overhead camera, um, obviously is on the ceiling, uh, but it also has that connection. And, and uh, it would be great if instead of running cables all the way up to it, we could wirelessly uh, uh, change all those settings. Um, now, it turns out that that was more complicated <laughs> than I thought it would mm -hmm. be in a lot of ways. Now, what's interesting is that um, uh, Blackmagic actually sells a Arduino shield mm -hmm. with an SDI, basically, so you can build exactly what I was talking about. But it, it costs like 150 bucks. Yeah, that's, that's a which, lot. Which is a lot in, this, in the realm of pro video stuff that's not actually that impressive. <laughs> Uh, that's not actually that much. And if you are like doing real, do, you know, pr creating a uh, production studio environment, that's an easy uh, amount of money to spend on something like oh, this, yeah. you know, um, rather than trying to hack something together. Uh, but that does, that's less fun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and this was like, this was not something that we needed. This was something that was like, hey, this could be kind of interesting. Maybe we could try out something. Yeah. But it turns and out. So it turns out, like I was saying, it turns out to be a little more complicated than I thought. So I thought, okay, let's start at an easier idea. Rather than doing the full, like, remote control, let's try and do uh, tally control. Um, and so for those of you who aren't familiar with um, the sort of studio speak, and we're super excited to hear that tally was going to be here yeah. today. <laughs> I'm sorry to inform you. Tally control, tally, the tally light on a camera is basically, that's the, the on-air light, yeah. right? So it's the light that's on a camera that tells, uh, that is supposed to tell the host which camera to look at and also tells the camera operator which camera is operational. It is not, in fact, an indication of when good friend of the show, Tally Hickey, is on-air. Yeah, yeah. So. 
the uh, that that would be that would be uh, amazing foresight for the entire motion picture industry. <laughs> I mean, that's not to say we couldn't make a tally light that did that, but that's not today's show. <laughs> yes, <laughs> if we just put a low jack on tally, yeah. I guess. <laughs> Facial recognition. Yeah. Uh, so the um, and so uh, the, the additional complication is that these cameras do have tally lights built into them, but of course the tally lights are also controlled by the ATAM system, mm -hmm. and the way the ATAM works is you're switching between cameras and stuff. But if you're in a situation that where you have say two cameras on screen at once. Which can happen. Which happens all the time. Like, yeah. for instance, when we do, uh, 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 you know, like a magic stream, we've got the overhead and then the two side cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, which, yeah, yeah. if yeah, we have like something that. like this, which cameras tally should turn, you know, all the tallies you would want on to let people know that those cameras are all active right now, uh, which it doesn't do so good. So my thought was I would build a, these. Uh, I would use, this little Ar uh, Arduino compatible thing, Madoodle, mm -hmm. uh, the ESP uh, eight two six six to uh, power some LEDs and uh, basically be and we could you know we could they're they're so cheap you know we could get a couple of them yeah. put them in little boxes with LEDs on them and those could be tally lights that we can control arbitrarily you know I can we could just send signals to them from anywhere from your phone. Or from uh, uh, you know from uh, a plug into the exploit editing soft uh, uh, edit software, or through from the ATEM or all sorts of different places. So you, it's all sorts of fancy things that you could do with that. And because this is Wi-Fi, they wouldn't need to be you know all connected together. They could yeah. just all you need is power, and uh, so that would be cool. Um, and so yeah, that's what uh, that's what this little dude does, and. Uh, Programming this thing was very interesting because, mm -hmm. uh, as you probably know, I've done a lot of programming in uh, PHP and JavaScript. Mm -hmm. uh, both noble languages. Both both noble languages, uh, but notably, uh, they are what what you would call what are, what are what is called uh, loosely typed <laughs> languages, uh, and uh, shall we say loose in general? Yeah. I would say. Uh, and the... and the the Arduino you the primarily anyway you're programming actually in like C plus mm plus -hmm. like yeah. or maybe even just C I don't know I don't actually know what the difference is I think it's a proprietary C like language C, C ish C like language. okay yeah. so we're not doing Python today I know that people have been very excited about uh, Arduino uh, adding Python support soon yeah and in fact I actually when I was looking up stuff I saw there's live there's somebody's made libraries for JavaScript on ESP uh, uh, and also on on Arduinos and stuff the problem with that of course is that at that point you're using like half the memory and processor power of the machine just to run your yep. actual <laughs> scripting language which is not really what you want to do uh, so anyway um, so this is in C, so just just me learning C or learning enough C to make this very simple thing uh, was basically like 90% of the time because I was like, how do I make two strings one <laughs> string? Why is this so hard? Yeah, exactly. What, what La, La, uh, Lathos Tyrion said, uh, said there, that doesn't work very well yeah, string one plus string two and like nope. in in x in in uh in javascript you do all sorts of stuff like you start a variable as false and then set it to whatever you want to do and then you can check whether it's actually been set or not whether it's false or not you can't do false is a boolean and and <laughs> strings are other different things and ints are different and there's it turns out that there's different types of ints i didn't even know this uh, there's ints with and then whether you, you put got your big ins, your short ins, your signed ins, and also where you put the asterisks in the name also change. Oh. There's ints, and then there's things that are pointing to ints, but aren't actually ints themselves. Like a pointer, like yeah. an integer pointer. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so anyway, and the problem is, of course, like if I could just, if I was just doing my own thing, I could just like stick with what I know. But you're integrating like three different libraries that have their own 
like, I've decided to use pointers for my library because I know how to do things. Ah, uh, so you get all, all the efficiency of C, but all of the crazy library mess of JavaScript. Yeah, yeah. Great. So anyway, uh, it, this is, this is a, a comparatively simple operation, but uh, uh, took me longer than it probably should have to, <laughs> to work out. But anyway, so the idea here is we've got this little dude here, and it can, uh, and the, actually the other really interesting thing, which isn't a C problem or a thing, it's just a, a fundamental problem once you start thinking about this as an, as an item, mm -hmm. is that like, if I was building say, a tally system to go on like a website or, or like a, uh, in XSplit, right. uh, you, you could make like a HTML interface to make it decide, to tell it what ID number it is. And you could, uh, uh, you know, set up, you, you know, do um, all sorts of UI elements. But of course, th this has no UI. There's no <laughs> screen. There's no input device. Right. Plus, it also has to connect to the Wi-Fi. Uh, so, and obviously to connect to Wi-Fi, you need to know like the the ID of the Wi-Fi you're connected right. to and the password yeah. and all this kind of stuff. So there's like a chunk, a big chunk of stuff that you need to do before you actually get to whatever fancy actual thing you want to do. Um, so there's actually a um, there's a neat system that people have already worked. Obviously, this is a problem that other people have encountered. Mm -hmm. So this is there's a system that I actually don't know if I can demonstrate it that well because it it already is connected to the Wi-Fi. But maybe I can change it. Anyway, um, but what happens to what happens with this in order to configure it is quite cool. What it does is it boots up. If there's no, if it can't connect to a Wi-Fi network, uh, it goes. Oh, okay. I'll start my own oh, Wi-Fi hey, network. Oh, that's not bad. I'll have my own network with booze <laughs> uh, and blackjack. Uh, and then you can go on your phone and connect to that Wi-Fi network, which gives you a little configuration screen to say, no, really, actually connect to this other <laughs> Wi-Fi network. It goes, oh, okay. Then reboots, and now that it knows what Wi-Fi network to connect to, connects to that Wi-Fi network and sets it all up. <sighs> it's, it's quite a brilliant, you know, it's one of these things, it's sort of this, uh, this bootstrapping itself system which is quite brilliant that people have worked. This yeah. is not something that I came up with. People worked, worked this out. Down that way. Um, I've actually switched, by the way, the, the, uh, the model I'm going to go with for the printing Ooh, here. Okay. Because uh, the one I've looked up here uh, will allow us to fit two holes into it. Uh, if we go back for the... Uh, That's why for they call him Ian Two Holes Two Holes <laughs> No! <laughs> the other thing is, like, we're, we're going to get two LEDs. This has a number of holes available, but... The point is, this way we can actually shove some LEDs through and uh, oh, neat. light things up that so way. So this is like a little flying saucer. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, we'll give that a try. So uh, we're going to... So put... it's in two pieces, I guess, yeah. eh? So we'll have to probably print the pieces to, uh, separately because I don't know if we'll have space on this, uh, on this board to do them both at once. Yeah, the actual the print area on this is quite small. Mm -hmm. But just to get that going here quickly so that it actually happens. Uh, also, you can't like turn it sideways to fit more stuff in. <laughs> I mean, you could get it up, but then you've got to deal with supports. And you I have noticed that... Think about, yeah, the, the, the orientation of the 3D printed device relative to the bed is very important. Well, I was once printing a, uh, a little sled for Cam's computer to uh, adapt his uh, small drives to a large size. Mm. And it was printed vertically because other, that was the only way it would fit. And I realized at the end of the print job, when it started to screw up, oh yeah, you have to, you have to take into account which way the bed is moving. The bed only moves forward and backward. So if you place the upright model such that it's that direction, it's going to start to wobble <laughs> and then eventually fall over and make a well, huge mess. And, then, and also the, the, because it's in the layers, that's like, the, that, the, the, the dimension that it's weak yeah, in is exactly. the, yeah. Whereas if you twist it that way, then everything works a little bit better. Yeah. Flip it turn-wise, exactly. Yeah. But I've had, uh, I've had good luck with uh, doing a, uh, a raft for, 
separating, but because this is just, we're, we're trying to be quick, we're just going to do a, a skirt for build plate adhesion. There's going to be, we're going to let it stick directly to the plate rather okay. than building something there. Do you put down anything on the plate before you do the printing? No, no, you do not. Cool. It does it by itself. And thankfully, uh, oh, really? Okay. So the nice thing about the slicer is it'll give you an estimate as to how long it's going to take. This one's going to take an hour and 16 minutes to print this base. Mm. So we'll save that to a file. Uh, we're going to put that on the local SD card. Please. Assuming that it does. The, the, the time estimate is behind us, but yeah. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> I could probably drag that up. Not, not the fastest 3D printer. This is not, that, that, that speed, you know, May not be indicative if you've got a 3D, if you are interested in 3D printing, you know, depending on what kind of printer you have, obviously this time varies. Hmm. I'm having issues with this SD card though, so that might be a problem. Oh well. Oh. It's funny. The, uh, I just saved it to the desktop. You know, I used to be a, uh, I, I used to do a lot of tech support for people, like as a job, and this was, you know, before 3D printers were really like a thing that you would have on your desktop. Uh, and uh, regular printers probably caused the most, uh, have caused the most uh, tech support issues. <laughs> Basically anything, scanners too. Basically anything, if it's like in the computer, it's fine. And if it's, you know, a physical thing, you don't have to worry about it, but it's the interface between the yeah, computer between the and the, the computer world and the physical world, because the physical world is never quite as nice uh, and precise. Yeah, you know, you don't have to deal with like inertia, or <laughs> or things falling over because <laughs> they're moving too fast or whatever, in the in the in the computer world. I'm just going to copy these things over because we now have our G code. Put those on the SD card. Get on there. Okay, perfect. And then I'm going to pass this over to you. Ooh. Alrighty. Yeah, let me um, quickly. Well, for one, oh, I looks like it changed the. Uh, oh, it didn't change the board, right? It changed or it didn't save the. So we we've set up our uh, Arduino development environment ahead of time to save a little time. Yeah. We'll leave that if you want to do that as an exercise for the viewer. I'm just going to flip this and, on. And it will be exercise. It will be difficult. To... <laughs> uh, so anyway, I, I mean, um, you can see a little bit like the, the code isn't that significant here in terms of, can I make it big? Oh, Hopefully that's cool. it's reasonably legible. Um, you know what? I think these... Uh... This card might be pooped. Not, no, not pooped, but I think it actually might be too big for the printer. Oh. It's, it's 64 gigs. <laughs> oh, the printer is like, ah, I can't handle. <laughs> um, so basically, all of this stuff, the, this, this, this part here, this is all about the actual, like, connecting and making it work and stuff. <laughs> the part that I, like, made or got to go, was, or got to work it is you know these things where it's it's sending the tally signals um and actually the other the other fun part actually the other thing that i'm i'm slightly proud of um is so you've got this problem so you say you've got five of these around the, the uh around your studio right uh and but again they don't have if you just turn them on they don't have like you don't know what to, to send signals to them, yeah. you got to know what their IP addresses are. Right. And you can go onto your router, and you could probably check your DHCP table or whatever, um, and find out, um, uh, and find out what they are. Uh, but uh, I figured I, I figured out what you can do using something that I have not used before, is something called uh, broadcast, which an Aaron just mentioned there. Ooh. Um, is what you can do is uh, you can, um, it's a s somewhat underused 
aspect of uh, net network systems because usually you don't want to send a signal to every single computer on your network. Right. Um, but uh, in this case, this is called UDP broadcast. Uh, this, this is UDP broadcast. And what this is good for is sending out a very, very small... So basically, this is just sending out a little... This is just a poke. Uh, and all it... And because... And it's sending out a poke on a very specific... Uh, uh, very specific IP address that only these guys are listening to. So no other... Uh, no other system on the network will respond to it. And all it does is when it gets that poke, it then responds with uh, its IP address. Oh, really? Um, and so, and I have a little web interface that I made that I can do this. Aha! I can, uh, I can scan for devices, and then it will say, oh, yeah, I found this one device. And it's called Tally 8. That's even fantastic. Though, uh, and then... Let me, uh, wait, let's see if, if we zoom in here. Uh, hopefully this will be visible. Okay, so there's the little thingy. There's that. And I want to turn it on. The light goes on. Hey. And then I can turn it off. Oh, no, I can turn it into, this is preview or uh, off or program. Okay, so different, different brightness. So it, so the problem is, of course, so part of the reason why I wanted to come here and do this is that I don't know how to do like soldering <laughs> and stuff. And so the I was like, great, I figured this out. I've got this whole system set up. It'll be great. How do I actually, the, the chip knows what tally light it's supposed <laughs> to be. Uh, and then I'm like, wait, how, how do I actually make the chip how, how do I make the, this thing explain to the world what tally light is supposed to be? Right. And luckily, this particular development board has a little, has a power LED built into it. So that we can And use. so I was able to light power LED uh, to, to do, but it's a very small uh, dim, like it's, you know, if that LED was like on top of a camera on the other side of the room, you wouldn't see it. You'd anything. never see it. Um, it's just supposed to be for power and stuff. So. Now we can, um, uh, so the idea is that with the, uh, using the little uh, uh, pins on the side of the thing, we can attach better LEDs and right. theoretically change my code to, instead of lighting the power light, light the better LEDs, and then we have a thing. Perfect. That's hopefully what we're doing today. That's, yeah. <laughs> hopefully. So, yeah. Um, well. So for the are we are we kind of uh, in trouble on this uh, or not able to do much on this? Well, and I'm going to need with the we don't have a we need a small yeah I'd need a smaller SD card that I could format into something that's just fat rather than X fat. Oh. Sixty four gigs is too big. Can you format just like a partition on it? I guess it doesn't work that, mm. not that way. Yeah, mm, maybe maybe. Let me see uh, if I can do that. Do I have damn, to? Uh, damn are two good <laughs> mini play things. This is the thing. When you, when you work in a, uh, a video environment, you end up dealing with, uh, dealing with large, large amounts of video files. Yeah, after Road Quest, we ended up, we have, we have many, many ginormous uh, micro SD cards. <laughs> Enor enormous in, in capacity, not in physical size. Micro SD cards are very, very small. I often think about like, uh, you know, back in the day they talk about you. Know, there's they're like the, the like uh, uh, super spy, like James Bond super spy with like the the microfilm. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. just think about like a 64 gig micro uh, SD card could store like literally every single document in like the Kremlin or yeah. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Plus video of it all. Uh, the, the, how much, you know, what they would have given for that kind of storage capacity back in the day. Well, thankfully, we have... Uh, a, the micro SD that sent, you sent with it, I believe, is at home. Currently, yes. <laughs> <laughs> all righty then. Uh, XFAT, that's what we're looking for. So we want to... 
Uh, we want to make a new, well, delete all partitions, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, da, 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 delete the partition. Pictures of bus size hard disk from back in the day. But I love my, my um, one of my teachers when I was in university had a old, like one, one of these like uh, ancient um, hard drives. But what was awesome about it is it looked like a regular hard drive, just scaled up. Mm -hmm. Like the platters were like laser discs. <laughs> And like the arms were like it, it looked exactly it looked like like a like a Gulliver's Travels or whatever style like they just had scaled everything, which you expect it to look different. Yeah. <laughs> it's like new new different technology, but no, it was about the same technology. It's the same technology, <laughs> just ginormous. Well, I think that's I think that's gonna work. I at least I hope it's gonna work. We'll find out very quickly. And eject because. Nobody cares about unmounting things these days. Oh, I mean, clearly you don't. <laughs> Not in Windows. All right. And let's put that down. Bring it back up. It makes a satisfying clunk sound when it powers up. No files. Okay, so I guess a partition isn't... So it acknowledges that it exists, but it says no file. Yeah. Well, we could always try plugging it in, but I think that might be a fool's errand. <laughs> Especially because we, uh, we don't want it to crash while we're in the middle of uh, working on... It's a good point. Does, if a, is, is this one of those things like the, uh, like the uh, CNC cutters and stuff? Like if it crashes, does it like... Oh, no. Catastrophically <laughs> fail? No, it'll be and fine. start, like, spraying stuff everywhere? <laughs> <laughs> no, it'll be fine, I think. It would be, uh, it would just kind of push mess around and kind of get really, uh, really blobby. So I guess we should just uh, get into the, the making then, I guess. So I mentioned Gbot, uh, 16 gig cards during packs. I mean, we probably have little ones around yeah, somewhere, around somewhere but... It'll, it'll take time to find it right now. Um, one of the other actually kind of interesting aspects of this is something that I did while I was in the course of making this. And this is actually something that I've done a couple times working with um, uh, pro sort of proprietary hardware or specific pieces of hardware. Mm -hmm. Is that I just as a as a as a uh, kind of how how I generally work is I'm often working at home or I'm working here in the office on different computers because uh, you know because people are using Studio C or you're using different studios and stuff and so I'm moving around quite a lot and uh, for as we we're talking about with the um, there's sort of the Arduino development environment that you have got to get set up and going um, and so I wanted to. Uh, and, and whenever you change something on this, there's a process where you have to like change it and then recompile and then re-upload it. It takes a process. Yeah. It's kind of a pain in the butt. And so something that I did um, is that I uh, I built I, I made a um, basically like a simulation a, a, a API if you would want to call it API uh, simulation of this in. Uh, JavaScript or whatever, Ooh. like not and not obviously an actual simulation of this, but just a JavaScript uh, uh, page that would respond to the same signals that I was sending to this, right? So that I could debug the other half of the problem <laughs> of the thing, you know, the, the <laughs> thing that was sending the signal. Um, and I sort of so I did that for my own benefit, and I sort of inadvertently realized that I kind of made I made like a tally system. Uh, that you could use on like a phone. Uh, so by the th same thing, I can set this. So if you want to, you know, save uh, save money on your on getting a tally system, <laughs> and instead use like four hundred dollar phones as your tally system, uh, you can do that too. That seems like a good use of funds. I mean, some a lot of people have a lot of like phones just randomly lying around these days because uh, theoretically obviously the, the the technical requirements for um, uh, for just basically a page that changes color is not um, 
is not intense. It doesn't have to be the latest <laughs> phone for it to work. No. One second. I just realized I moved something into here. That should... uh, so, uh, yeah, so this is... I was going to suggest, yeah, we should get soldering. Yeah, let's, let's see what right. we can do here with and this. And that's, that's where it went. I was looking for this bag of the parts provided uh, kindly by Quail Electronics here in Victoria, if you're in town. Check I them mean, out. Not, like, bought from. They oh, no, no, they, they, they gave them to me. Oh, really? Yeah, mainly oh, because nice. he, he couldn't look up the parts in the system, so... <laughs> it was <laughs> literally easier to give it to you than, yeah, to, than, than to, try to bother and looking up the yeah. price. So you won't get the same deal I did, but uh, hey, they're good boys. So what I've got here are uh, a f number of... And I, I got a couple things in depending on what we wanted to do today. Uh, no SDXC support. Aha, uh -huh. that's why. So we'll need to find a, uh, maybe at the break, a smaller SD card. Mm. So I've got with me a few LEDs here. These clear ones are, uh, these are infrared LEDs. Mm. So should we want to actually uh, turn this into an IR blaster of some sort? Or perhaps for a future project, we'll keep those in lock is it so that i guess that it's it's weird for some reason like infrared it seems like infrared it's like ooh, they must be super fancy but it's of course it's just in leds don't really care what wavelength of light they're yeah, putting exactly. out right <laughs> but these uh guys here are they've got three pins on them because they are dual color leds red mm -hmm. and green so is it just if you put to one it goes one color and the other goes the other color exactly Cool. So, uh, and while I was wandering around the internet when we were talking about this project, I also came across someone who has basically done this exact sort of thing for us. Well then. Yeah. Except this is for a three-color one. Yes, but I think the principle is still sound. They, they handily have a, uh, a, a diagram that we can show off of how this works. Yeah, an IR tally system. Yeah. It's perfect. <laughs> and it nicely spells out uh, which, which pins we'd want to use, too. Adding Wi-Fi to the printer via Raspberry Pi. Yes, that is a thing that we could. That is a thing that we could do. Yeah, uh, via OctoPrint. And in fact, actually, this. Oh, hold on. This printer actually has Wi-Fi in it. Really? Yes. It's not generally very good, but <laughs> that's something I can maybe uh, look into later. Mm. Anyway. We'll get into that uh, octo print. That's for printing eight things at once. Mm. So uh, I'm going to grab uh, some wire and a couple of resistors here, okay. and then start putting together a circuit. And I was saying that uh, so in if you want to just take so that laptop right over to your side there start setting up my station so in my code here you can see uh the the the, the three important uh functions we got here preview live and off so setting the thing to preview setting it to live and setting it off uh right now they're like when it says live it says digital right to the built-in led uh set it low uh which makes it turn on because Stupid reasons. <laughs> <laughs> because they decided to make the LED opposite from normal LEDs. Oops. Uh, and then preview sets it to 900, which is just kind of a dim uh, light. And then uh, turning it off uh, sets the built-in LED to high, which turns it off. I believe the reason why the built-in LED is reversed is so that normally... Uh, if it means that there's if there's no signal going to it, the light will turn on. So like when it's doing a a reboot or whatever, it can turn it on uh, or something like that. I don't know. There, I'm sure there's a reason for it, but it's silly. <laughs> All right, I didn't buy resistors for this project, so I'm going to have to do some hunting here. Ooh, we or... need to find the specific colors. Yes, and here we go. Yep, red black brown brown gold and that's uh that's a 1k resistor i'm going to make sure that, that is also correct 
Red, does it matter what order they're in? I don't think it does, actually, from my uh, f from my experience last time hunting down resistor levels. But I'm going to check because that's an important thing to do. Urgh, there we go. So the idea here is that the uh, the signals that the uh, the little uh, Wemo is setting out sending out are too powerful for the. Yeah, we just want to bring down the voltage a bit. Okay, there nope. we go. Nova Girl 5 uh, says of the Wi-Fi, Ian, it's dumb, don't use it. You need to download a Chinese app for a phone. I already have the app for the phone because I tried it once before, thinking this might be a good idea. You're too late. He's already lost. <laughs> okay, this seems off. 0.13. Well, that's, that's not the number it should be at all. Get on there. Okay. Then I get to 2K. And it gets me 0 0.12. That seems off. Hmm. Did is my... Have your resistors gone off? Is my... Cal oh, wait. If it's a 5, that's if it's a 4 band. But if it's a 5 band, then it's... Brown, black, black, brown, brown. Maybe these are five band things. <laughs> what have I done now, Corey? Is this like armadillos? Like you have the different, like a three band armadillo and a five band armadillo. <laughs> and depending on which, how many bands they have, they have a different amount of electrical resistance. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Probably that holds true for armadillos, too. <laughs> All right, because we don't want to we don't want to burn our, our LED out. Ideally not. That's a big guy. Uh, let's see here. I don't see any brown, black, black, brown, browns. Is that a brown, black, black? That's a brown, black, black, gold. I like the, just this, like, assorted resistors. <laughs> well, this was a kit that I, uh, from someone's electrical engineering class that I... Oh, I see. I uh, inherited. Yeah, there should be at least eight uh, 1K resistors in here. So... Brown, black, red, gold. Brown... Black, red, gold. That's what I mean. That's what he's showing here. Yeah. So that tell. So it could just be that I ended up with a bad resistor. Let's make this a little easier on myself. Okay, that's correct. That's what we like mm. to see. So perhaps that other one. Your resistors have just gone off. Yeah. <laughs> They're getting old. You have to refrigerate your resistors. Oh, does that matter? Well, you know what I've just learned today, Paul? Mm -hmm. Order, in fact, does matter. <laughs> Wait, how do you know which way to read it, though? How do you know if a resistor the is upside down? The gold is like the quality band, so it's the last number. Ah. So gold will always be the have, last one. Have you just been sitting there being like, he'll figure it out? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, savage Corey. <laughs> Good to have you back on the program. <laughs> okay, uh, so we found one. Now we just need to find... Oh, wait, I think I found another one in there. Hey, oh, that was my good friend. Perfect. And that's all we need to get one of these done. Alrighty. So I'll throw those back in there haphazardly, because why would we ever sort those? I'm sure it's a thing where first year electronic students have to memorize their things and start to learn how to pick things up very quickly. Yeah, yeah. 
it's one of those like it re little remi it reminds me of like the the like uh i know that there's like the codes for like pills like the two sides of a capsule every like i guess i don't know about every pill but the the what colors the two oh, sides of really? the capsule are those matter yeah, you can you see some that you if you look like behind the counter at like a pharmacy, they'll have they have, there's like a chart I where have. it's like the the colors. Which huh. I've seen those charts and the colors and stuff and I'm like, there are so many drugs. There can't be that many combinations of two colors. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get out our good friend the T S eighty. Mm. And get that powered up. I'm excited to test the new USB power brick I purchased specifically for this. Ooh, right, because the problem was the, the the it requires a hefty power, right? Specific and a specific type of hefty power. Uh -huh. It requires the Qualcomm Q3 system, not USB powder powder. USB powder delivery would be an interesting. I, I mean, there's all sorts of weird little USB. Thing. Yeah, but if, if you if you got your solder gun and just sort of coughs some mm. powder at you, that wouldn't be actually. It. By the way, yeah, the other oh yes, three D printed thing, three D printed uh, soldering fingers, which are quite useful, and a solder a three D printed soldering roll holder, which I'm quite Man. happy to finally have. That uh, that was a, a pretty substantial roll of that. Uh, of that pink filament, You've gotten mm -hmm. a lot of use out of it. Oh yes, and I, I, I uh, I'm aware in the uh, chat people have been mentioning, uh, specifically Nova Girl, that uh, Amazon now sells their own Amazon Basics line of filament. Oh, neat. for inexpensive. Yeah, inexpensive is a word. <laughs> for, in, for, 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 inex for inexpensive. So I guess what we need to do here is we need to. Uh, so there's the ground goes to the ground on the board yeah and then the two prongs go to is the idea that you can basically just put them to any pins and then you just have to know which pins and then you tell it i to think send, that's the idea yeah. tell the system what pins to send the signal to yeah i'm pretty sure the center piece is ground i'm going to pretend yeah what's the long pin so i would assume that that's ground so we need a resistor on both sides uh, okay good let's uh now, should we coat these with anything, or should we just let them be nice and open? Because I don't think we want, we don't want to short anything on this. What do you mean coat them? I'm thinking of coating them with, uh, with, with a uh, shrink tube. Was the, was there a thought to do it on a breadboard There was, thing? and then the breadboard wasn't in the box. Ah. So we're going to do it live. Okay. <laughs> Unless I have another breadboard here, which I don't think that I do. Let me just double check mm. our utilities. Delicious breadboard. <laughs> so, no. Actually, it probably makes sense if we add some, if we give it some wire, so that that way it's out oh, of the way. And like then we can actually... color coded wire thing. Well, thank you. It's, it's, it's like a. You look, it's like a ribbon thing for like wrapping presents. <laughs> yeah. So it's a nice little uh, set of silicone wire, which makes it easy, uh, more heat resistant and a little bit easier to solder with. But, okay, we'll just have to do this the hard way too. <laughs> Such Tinker a... Tinker Taylor Solder Fry, we'll do this the hard, hard way. way. <laughs> I didn't bring the wire stripper. That's what your teeth are for. Yes. <laughs> so we don't need much wire here, but we'll uh, we'll do a black, a green, and a, and a red. And, you know, the, the red and the green might be on the wrong sides, but hey, we're going to find out together. And we don't need much, maybe only about that much. Because it's all going to have to fit inside of a, a case as well. Two and get the third one. Oh, is it causing problems again? I 
Hey, that was a good strip job, Ian. And just very lightly grip the wire and pull it off. Man, who said I needed wire strippers? I certainly didn't. <laughs> And now just the black wire. There we go. And finally, boom shaka. Great! And do we have any shrink tube just to make it very nice? Oh, we have just enough pieces to take care of that one side or if we use some slightly thicker shrink tube even maybe we can encase these uh these resistors in with them as well make it a little bit easier to deal with all right so here's my thought mm -hmm. we solder the resistors right up to the pins and then we go from pins yeah, to wire uh, oh am i inside non-beard area. <laughs> All right. Can I use this or is that going to be... No. So that's only good for wires, unfortunately. So let me grab our third hand. Clamp, clamp. Give it the clamps. And I guess we'll start with the, uh, I'm going to guess top. Top is probably. To make it easier, you can bend the little leggies. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm also thinking of actually trimming the leggies as well. A bit. Yeah, let's trim them down to about half size. Trim after you solder. That's a good idea. <laughs> solder twice, trim once. <laughs> That's the Tinker Tailor way. I mean, it isn't, but <laughs> <laughs> it maybe should be. Okay, and let's flip that around that side. And then flip it back around and solder from the bottom. That's the one issue with these third hands, is getting things into position is always a difficult endeavor. Oh, and then we actually grip the LED housing itself. And that way... That way... We're... I wouldn't. No? No. And also, like, you want the uh, third hand to act as a heat sink along the leads. Oh. Well, I was thinking just the opposite. You want your bulb to get hot. <laughs> All right. Nope, you're, you're exactly right. That's what I don't want. But Yep, yeah, drop that. Fiddly work. Okay, there we go. That's starting to get into position now. And then twist that up there. Great. Contact. All right, now we'll turn this on, get it up to 400 degrees Celsius centigrade, Celsius centigrade. Oh, wow. It's giving me a little, uh, little countdown. Tell me how long it's going to take to heat up. Hopefully that's what it's counting down to <laughs> as it starts to smoke. I'm not sure if we can get that on the, uh, on the camera there at all, but got a 
little meter there for how much water, what kind of wattage it's uh, drawing, tip temperature, and uh, the voltage that it's pulling. Currently, ten. It's pulling it, pulling ten voltage. <laughs> <laughs> ten voltage. And nineteen watt. All right. Just give me some heat. And, and let it go. And I'm going to say that's probably a good drawing there. Yep, that looks fine. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Just fine. Now I get to trim it. Get right in there. Yep. Good, nice. It has, it has 10 electricities in it. <laughs> and then make sure you're not, gra don't grab more than one pin with those nippers. And then we'll get a, uh, no. <laughs> you know what I just realized? I don't think I have my lighter with me either, so shrink tubing might not be in effect. Mm. So we'll just have to be sure not to uh, short out this LED while we're playing with it. All right, so that's one down. Uh, next one is same idea. Bend the side. Bend the side. Mount it inside. Gripple. Which is a technical term. Is it? <laughs> it is not. Mm. See, I would have believed you. Uh, you could have totally, you could have, you know, yeah. I I, it seems like the kind of thing that could be called a, a gripple. A gripple. <laughs> well, it is now. All right. Provide some heat there. And make sure the solder chamber. Ooh, that might be a coal. Well, that wasn't good at all. I'm. I'm assuming is there is it a very very bad idea to to use the solder thing for the shrink tubing? Uh, you, you you risk end up uh, you you risk burning the shrink tubing, but then we can give it a try. I, I've never said no to giving something a try. I mean, can't you can set the temperature? Lower. That's true. I mean, yeah, why don't lower we? than fire <laughs> if you're <laughs> using fire mode. Right. Clean tip. And there we go. That's a decent joint as well. Nice. Okay. All right. Let's clean that up, and then let's get some wires on there, so that we can connect that up to one of our minis. And I noticed you've got your pin headers there. So is this? Am, am, this is the right? This is the right one here. So theoretically, you would just kind of insert that in there. Yeah. And then solder it or whatever. But you know, actually, you know, now that I think about it, if we're just testing this out right now, we can just go with the the pins themselves. As a through, just through the hole. If we were to use, uh, yeah, these guys, or better yet, these guys. These long-legged ones. The idea here being that if you solder them through, now you have the ability to do wire in the top, but also use the pins in the bottom. Wire in the top, party in the back. <laughs> uh, so then the idea, uh, again, I don't know if this is, is it, can you read the little uh, little screen? In your but you can see that there's, there, there's one up here that says G, that's your ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the rest of the pins uh, are so there's the G there, there's a 5 volt one, there's 3V3 volts, and then there's a bunch of uh, of these D yeah, digital digital pins. Yeah. Uh, and there's also an analog, a few analog pins and stuff. And so the idea being that um, we can attach the uh, LED things to these, and then theoretically I can tell this to send signals to those pins rather than to the built-in LED thing. Yeah. 
So what I'm thinking, actually, before we even actually go about soldering in here, because honestly, I think we might be better off actually soldering the wires directly to the board rather than putting pins in, mm. especially if we want to put it in a case of any sort. Right. What we should do is probably get the software ready, and then we can make some tests using the multimeter. Oh, okay. And that way we can see cool. how it's putting out, and we can actually see how much voltage it's putting out as well. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So we can actually just like stick the multimeter in yeah, the... Yeah, right onto the pins. Cool, and see that it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Neat. It's like testing. But with <laughs> it's, it's, it's testing. It is actually it's testing. It's testing. <laughs> we're allowed to test things. Oh, I work with hardware, with software just, too much. Just because we're not allowed to learn things <laughs> doesn't mean we can't test things. <laughs> It's like testing, but with hardware. So, testing. Uh, okay. All right. So, so. Um, let me just see here. So, uh, for instance, the live thing. Um, right now, it's going to digital write to the built-in, the constant built-in LED uh, low. So, presumably, there are corresponding constants for the other mm -hmm. pins. I just have to figure out what those are. One sec. We'll look those up. Maybe this would be a good time to go on a quick commercial break. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Actually, <laughs> let's do that. Let's uh, take a quick commercial break, and we'll be back with some more hardware hacking and testing on Tinker Tinker Soldier Fry. Don't go away. Welcome back, Tinker Tailor Soldier Fry, where we are working on our tally lights. And we've just gotten our code in order, have we not? Yeah, yeah. It turned out to be a real simple uh, setup. Um, so, uh, yeah, we just um, have replaced the thing with blackness. Mm -hmm. Complete and yes. cutter inky blackness <laughs> because the NDI has stopped broadcasting, That's perhaps? It's going to be my guess. Are we still on the network? It should be. Let's not. Uh... Hey, there we go. Hey. It was ah, there. there we go. Thanks, you, NDI. Uh, does it um, keep any memory so that it doesn't have to keep reloading it? All right, so uh, you can see here um, that so there's two parts to this. Uh, we've got uh, up here, we're defining, uh, luckily, so the, 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 the LED that I, I was thing was called, where it had a, there's a built-in thing called uh, built-in LED. Mm -hmm. Weirdly enough, if you want to talk to pin D5, then you say red pin equals D5. Ah. <laughs> and if you want to talk to pin D6, red pin equals, or green pin equals D6. Hey. Uh, and so then, so what we're doing is we're going to, and then the setup is like what happens when it first boots up. Uh, we're, we're saying um, set the pin mode of these two pins to out, output. So okay. we're sending, going to be, because of course you could also attach uh, uh, sensors. So it's this. a bidirectional, oh, so these are bidirectional digital pins? Yes. Wow. Um, and then we're going to, we're going to write low to both of them. So we're just going to make sure they're off. Yeah. Uh, and then the other part of this is that down here, you can see I've just commented this out just to be, just yeah. to be careful. Um, so we're going to say the built-in LED, so instead of built-in LED low, we're going to, when it's live, we're going to set the red pin high. And uh, when it's off, we're going to set both pins low. And when it's at preview, we're going to send the green pin high. Okay. Uh, so. So those are D5 and D6, correct? Uh, yes. So the red pin is D5 and the green pin is D6. Okay. And right. those can, if for whatever reason, for if we want to change that to make, if it were, maybe it would make it for make them far, like if it was like D five and D seven, maybe that would be mm -hmm. better. That might make know, things whatever. easier. But if it's so already let, compiled, let's, let's see. Uh, well, it isn't actually. Let me uh, compile it. Uh, L Specter, uh, no, a heat gun would would be fine at the border, I think. I mean, it depends on how how uh, hot the heat gun. Uh, like at a certain point, it becomes like a laser gun. Yeah, I guess. That's, that's how much heat <laughs> a flamethrower? I guess is technically a heat gun. How much heat and how much gun is going to really depend on whether or not it's accepted? All right, and we're looking at voltage. Uh, Ricky, I am using a forty-four percent of the storage space, which honestly is like more than it probably should be. <laughs> but as I said, this is more for 
uh, doing it in the way that I know how, not like the most efficient way. I'm using like, like a bunch of libraries and stuff that are, I'm sure, not as efficient as they could be. Let us attempt to upload it. Right, I always forget that uploading also compiles it. I probably <laughs> didn't need to compile it first. Oh, com port not selected. Oh, right. Which com is this com That's port? three. Well, uh, are there other com ports currently in use? Well, we'll there's try three. two options. They'll either make with the flashy flashy or that seem. Uploading. Okay. It'll either be yes or no. No. Okay. So Upload failed. Possibly COM4. Haha. -ha. The process of elimination. Try it again. Please upload without compile. Ah! Compiling again. <laughs> Yeah, we should point out, did we, uh, I think we mentioned that these are specifically ah, the, there it goes. the Wemos uh, Zoom D1 is the, the type of ESP board that we're working off of. There are other ESP boards out there? Yes, D1 Mini. Yeah. I've used a Note, I've also worked with the Node MCU, which is a, a fun one. Mm. And I, I'm... Which I... When I saw I was excited and then disappointed that it wasn't actually like node node. That was my thought too. I was like, JavaScript, Rip. yay. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so that uploaded. Okay, so great. now, uh, let me see here. So it should be, if I do this, okay. So if I go like this, it should now be sending stuff to D5. To D5, you say. Okay. Well, let's make sure I've got you, my... You sunk my ESP ship. I'm just going to make sure I'm getting... thing. I've got my multimeter set up right here, so I'm going to give it a ground in 5 volts. And uh, that's I'm not getting... 5 volts. Yeah, I'm getting more than 5 volts, but that's okay. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, all right, so that you, this is pin 6. Uh, that should be D5, sorry. D5, okay. I think. Oh, no. No. So ground to ground and D5 to D5. Hey, we're getting 6.5 volts. That's good. Yeah. Again, that's... it's supposed to be 5 volts, but you know what? Hey, <laughs> sorry, it did a... Okay. Eight. Sorry, it, it, it's rebooting the thing because I hit the upload button again uh Oh, because... Yeah, and it just dropped down to zero volts. Okay, so it should have, it's rebooting. Actually, hold on. Let me show this to the chat as well. Hey, there we go. D5, ground. Okay, so now, so it should show nothing now. Nothing now. And then it goes, boop. There we go. And, and then it goes back to nothing. There we go. Aha, and now D, and then D6 should be the preview. Okay. D6. D6. Oh. <laughs> it's working. Well, we've got I don't mean work. to sound so surprised, but. <laughs> it's always good when that actually just, when it happens. When a plan comes together. Something's not right here. The D1 Mini is supposed to be a 3v3 board. Yeah. Really? Certainly not. Like there's, it says like five volt ground, and then all those ones, and then over here there's three v three. Oh yeah, there's. I, I I understand it. You can output both five and three. I guess. I guess. Hmm. Well, Ian said something about undervolting ruining circuits more than overvolting, but I'm an electrical engineer. So yeah, sector. I'm I'm kind of in the same uh, boat with you there, but. You may go to proper voltage when it's loaded. Is he testing between two signal pins? No, no, no. You're doing the ground in the signal, yeah, right? Ground to signal. So, hmm. Huh. But that's why we throw resistors on there, too. All right. Well, well, I guess so. 
now the question the thing is we wait we don't know which of these pins is red and which is green exactly were we supposed to know that <laughs> was there a way to know that that we messed up what i'm going to do to figure that out is i'm going to solder the uh the black wire on and then we're, we can solder that to ground okay. and then the other wires we can we can do some uh process of elimination as it were and by as it were i mean literally just process of elimination mm -hmm. The soldering earring back out. We get our third hand. Tighten up the waist of it a bit. Don't fat chain the third hand. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm actually going to use the uh, this piece and the third hand because I don't like how third hands really get aggressive when it comes to. Uh, with their yeah. grip. Gotta watch your third hand gets a little too handy. <laughs> Bend that out just a bit. So that we can get access to it. Um, I guess a, a little uh, background info for those of you who are more sort of uh, technically inclined. How this is, how the, the um, this connect, the, the signals are being sent to the uh, the tally system here is through a uh, WebSocket server that's connected to the, um, so they're all sort of in constant communication with each other uh, over the WebSocket thing. Um, and that means that not only can the, you know, something like this send the signal over to this, but it can also inform the controller what its current status is. So it's a bi-directional system. That's yeah, really yeah. good. Um, there was a system, a, a, one of the, um, uh, a, a example, like I, I saw some other people have made similar systems to this. Um, you know, I, as I was, I was talking about the, the, the UDP multicast thing for identifying the, um, the, uh, the boards. Um, and some people have done, have made tally systems that use UDP multicast for everything. So mm -hmm. just basically sends out a signal being like whatever if your id number six go live now if you're not you know if you're not don't do anything or whatever um or you know here's the new update for everyone's everyone's status everyone right. goes to these things um the problem with that uh is that one you don't have the bi-directional thing but then two um the other thing is that uh how the UDP uh, system works. Um, so, on the uh, when you're for for internet networking stuff, most of the time um, you're working with either two protocols: TCP/IP or UDP, or TCP or UDP. Um, uh, TCP/IP is usually what you would use for, like, say, going to web. You know, that's the the majority of stuff that you do is going to be using that, um, and it's what's called an end-to-end protocol in that you send a signal there that the computer goes I got that signal and you go great send me a thing um, and so there's it's what it's included into it is what's called uh, uh, the, the the guaranteed delivery so you send the signal out and if for instance the computer doesn't respond back saying I got that you then can send the, it'll you'll keep sending the signal oh, okay. up until a certain point uh so that you can be pretty sure as as a programmer it's you can be relatively certain that the signal got there eventually uh or or which is um which is handy for you know if like for like a web page or something if for whatever reason there's a glitch in the system and they don't get a picture you want your web you want your server to resend that picture to them so that they do get right. it. udp uh, doesn't do that. There's no guaranteed delivery. Uh, but the advantage to that, of course, is that it's a lot faster because it doesn't have to wait for the response. And you can do these things like the multicast things because obviously uh. you can't wait for delivery to every single network system on the, uh, on the network. Right. Um, so UDP, you just send out the signal and what happens, happens. <laughs> so in this case, what I'm doing is I'm sending out a signal to I say like everybody tell me who you are so if 
for whatever reason, one of the signals doesn't get there, or the Arduino, or... <laughs> Ooh, yeah, I think, well, actually, maybe, maybe, you know what, I'm going to actually disconnect this. Disconnect it, yeah. Because we don't need to actually have this uh, connected while I'm soldering directly to it. Or the, uh, you know, or the, the, the Arduino is busy doing something else, or there's weird network conditions, you know, it's over Wi-Fi, so who knows, there's weird things can happen. If it doesn't get that notification, it won't tell, it won't say that it's here, but you can just send a UDP thing again, okay. and it'll come and fine. It goes through. If you're sending your tally lights out that way, like, you don't want to randomly not have some of your tally lights turn on right. sometimes. You want, the, yeah. You, you, <laughs> like, you need that guaranteed that you, it's like, I want you to go on live, I want you to go live, and then I want you to tell me that you have gone live. <laughs> That's the whole idea. <laughs> yeah. All right. I've got that in place. Now it's time to actually solder directly to the board. I, why did I why did I let that go off power? <laughs> so the trick here is like I was saying, um, would it be better? Like I could easily change it so that it's not five and six. No, no, it, it, because uh, th these are extremely flexible wires, oh, okay. which is why I chose and kept feel on that too. That is a ooh, those are weirdly flexible. Yeah, silicone coating. So floppy. And there's less of a chance of burning the white, uh, burning the insulator too. Oh, because the insulator is actually very uh, thermally. Exactly, being silicone whatever. rather yeah. than just a PVC Neat. or PVA. All right, are we up to temperature? The answer is yes. So let's heat up on one, two, three. Add some solder. Let go. Don't inhale the delicious smelling smoke. And that's a connection. All right. So let's reconnect that up. Uh, okay. And then we'll boot it up. It's going to take a couple seconds. And uh, let's say, let's test D7 first. Uh, six and five is where it is. Okay. So <laughs> seven won't do anything at all. Let's test if six. If D7 does something, we're in trouble. So six is the one we're going to give a try to. Let's see, is it? Hello? Hopefully it'll wake up. Hello, computer. No, there's no no bri unnecessary bridges. Shall I reset it? Okay. Yeah, if I, were, if I remember looking at the code, you had it pretty high baud rate there. Oh, there it is. Ah, I got it. Good. Okay. Because I just had to reset it. So. Okay, here we go. D6. Uh, D, wait, no. D6 should be that one. Okay. No. Nothing's happening there. Nothing's happening there. Yeah, D6 should be there. Did I? Nothing. Did I hoop that completely? You want to do a quick test on the, uh, yeah, see, see if it is sending the thing through? All right, so I'm going to do it from, thankfully, so D6 once more to ground. So, there. Interesting. I did solder the ground hole, right? Nope, didn't solder the ground hole. Oh, you soldered it to the five volt. Yep. Ah, so that's the problem. Okay. All right. So we'll disconnect that. Okay. That doesn't. We can. That can be undone. Oh yes, yes. 
thankfully soldering it. And, and you know what? I threw it into my bag because I didn't think I'd need it. But I thought it would be handy to have just in case. Let's have fun with soldering or desoldering braids. It's not that fun. <laughs> it's true. I mean, it's of the various ways to take solder off. I feel like it's one of the more fun ways. I don't know what the least fun way of taking solder off is. Licking. So I've got some of it off. Now we just need to heat it up and then apply constant reverse pressure. What's reverse pressure? <laughs> oh, you're pulling it. Yes. <laughs> it's a technical term, Paul. <laughs> I was like, I know what pressure is. L lifting? Uh, yep. I've... I haven't ruined this, but yeah, this is not a fun game. Don't you have a desoldery? Yeah, I do. Sucker have, thing? I do have a sucker. So maybe we give it this. Maybe we'll give this a suck first. I just, I really gotta know why you don't have any pliers for holding stuff. Oh yeah, I really should put together some sort of a a, a board holder, a, a, a jaw clamp. Where's my sucker? It's way over there. No, I meant like needle nose, like just in your hand. Oh, well that's what my hand is for. Need on those fingers. They provide good feedback. Sensitive to heat and, and cold. Ooh. All right, let's pull out all the fun tools. Now, I don't think there's much solder there left to remove, thanks to the braid. There wasn't much there. So. There we go. And then the other side. Just a bit more heat. Dunk. It is kind of a satisfying noise. <laughs> as long as you're expecting it. Yes. Like hearing kind of a pop when you're <laughs> just like working on a board seems bad generally. So I'm not going to pretend that I didn't, that I meant to do that. But it does help out when we go back and resolder the ground a second time because uh, we've now, we've inadvertently tinned our wire. <laughs> oh, but unfortunately when you do that, sometimes when you do that, you end up... It's now too thick? Yeah. And you know, the easiest way to do, deal with that is to just trim it and do it again. There we go. All right, so the possible slight upside turned out not to actually work. Yep. <laughs> All right, back in there. All back right, here we go. Here this we go. time through the ground hole. Yeah, so the second to side thing. Yes. Okay. Bend that down. Grab it with the grabby grabs. And you know what? I'm going to brush a little bit of... Uh, uh, flux on there too. Why I am amused by that TCP joke. And I was also amused by the <laughs> UDP joke previously. <laughs> Turns out, com yeah, computer, computers tend to be very verbose when they put things important. Okay, this time I didn't turn my soldering iron off, but it did dip down. Flat side. Give it some solder and release. Release. All right. That. So we are confirmed. That wire is next to the G pole. Yes. Good. <laughs> Let's try this mm. again. Thank you, micro USB, for being a one-way connector. All right. 
Okay. It's back up. It's back up. Okay. D6. D6. He's a red light. Oh, hey. That's not very bright at all. Yeah. Too much resistor, maybe? We might, yeah, we might not need as much resistor as we've got on there or anything. Uh, and then D... And then you have a... Or, so that's a red light, and then if you attach the other one, you get a green light. Yeah. Yeah, but that is very dim. So I'm going to... Hmm. You know what? Let's try something here. Because we've got extra LEDs. Give me D5. Should you not be holding it well, but... Uh, D5? Yeah, D5. Okay. Still pretty dim. I huh. can't tell if it's going through the resistor or... No, it shouldn't be going through the resistor then. What? Hmm. Is that not... Is the, the, the board is just doesn't have enough oomph? It might just be that it doesn't have enough oomph to get to push these this particular LED to a, a happy state. So we might just need... Uh, Better LED, or not better, but different LEDs. What do you want? There's an easy way to test that. I've got some here. Oh, just little ones. Yeah, you need the ones that came in that box. Yeah, exactly. So what have you got there going? Uh, ground. Let's bend that. So now. Uh, oh, I'll show you. So I should be on D6 at this point. Uh, that D6 should be on there. There we go. D6 should be on. Okay, this one just isn't even going at all. Hmm. Let's check that again with the multimeter. Okay, I'm going to go from the wire through to D6. So D6. 6.5 volts. Huh. Which it seems one is higher than it's supposed to be and two should be plenty high to run the LED. One would think, yeah. Now, if you... Oh, am I, sh am I sure that that LED is common cathode? Hmm. Yeah. What that's does that mean? A, that's a good point. I don't know. What does is, what is common cathode mean? Uh, that I also am not sure entirely, but I think it means that uh, you're, you're thinking of a, a common ground on that. It might. So, we are more for, let's say, let's say for a, uh, an interest stake, if it were a non-common cathode, what would, be a way to, what would be a way to tell by just looking at an LED? Either common cathode or common anode. Mm, 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 mm. Ah, yes, two positive, one negative versus one negative, two positive. Okay. Do you have a single ground? Right, because LEDs are directional. I keep forgetting that. One end is shorter than the other, which tells you which side is, is which. Right. Yeah. So I need to check the data sheet. Right. Diode mode with the multimeter. Okay. Huh. I don't know that this actually has a diode checker on it. No, nope, wait, it does. Are you planning to check your little two-pin one or the three-pin one? I'm going to start with the, the two-pin one here. Let's find out if that is... Oop. That's the one. Maybe it's the other way. We don't know whether that one works at all. That's a good point. Oh, and I think it needs to be on the other side here for that. Okay. Tune in as Ian figures out whether or not he knows how to use his multimeter. Okay. So yeah, I can't really tell via... You can just shove it in the board again the other way around. Yeah, that's probably the easiest way. Are you, uh, are, are we lit for D6? We are lit for D6. Okay. There. It's bendy. It's a bit more bendy. Okay, so that didn't do it. So, how about this side? 
Okay, this LED might just not. Yeah, we have no indication whether that LED yeah. works at all. <laughs> the other LED we know like did light up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that, like, if if it is indeed, if we're wiring this the wrong way, would it wouldn't it not wire wouldn't it not turn on at all? Or is what we're seeing here where going dim means that it we have it wired correctly, just not enough current? Hmm. Hard to say. I, I'm even questioning whether or not my, uh, my diode mode is working on this or if I've got this connected the right way. Hmm. All right. So that needs to be there. Dim on an LED means correct wiring but not enough current. Okay. Okay. So that's good. So, um, is there anything we can do to make this more current without, I don't know, adding terrible things? Well, we, we, the easiest thing to do is to use a, uh, a smaller or, uh, or just less, yeah, yeah, a smaller value resistor. Or we could just try but, no I resistor. I mean, you, you tried attaching it directly on the other side of the resistor, didn't that's you? That's a good point, and it was yeah. still, it was still dim. Let's try with a... What if you just, like, attach a wire to there, like from there to there. Let's do that. That way, that'll give us an easy test. Uh, D6. Let's use a D the D6 pin. Uh, yep. Yeah. So D6 should still be active. Now. Okay. I'm just going to solder a wire there for ease of use. Yeah. You know what? Let's unplug this. <laughs> Soldering while running is always a recipe for disaster. <laughs> Make sure always, it's grounded. Always, always. Now, um, with the with this board, is the are the pins that are on like the the? I'm curious as to like because there's there's pins on this side. There's pins on both sides. Mm -hmm. In one side has it's has like a three v three pin at the bottom, and the other side is a five volt pin at the bottom mm -hmm. would could it be that w would the pins down one side put out five volts and the pins on the other side put out 3.3 volts i don't is think that a thing i don't think so i think it's based upon what sort of voltage is it receiving and receiving from the the computer would be the 5.5 okay but the uh the 8266 is a three 3.3 volt chip so i them put out 6.5 volts is the Pretty that, is a, that is an interesting aspect of this. Yeah, because we're not doing anything strange with regards to the programming. We're not telling it to overvolt anything. No, I mean it's I, setting it too high, which yeah. is how it should work. Yeah. It's it's a it's a digital pin. Well, oh. You're supposed to be hotter than that. Yeah, because without the data sheet on these LEDs, it's difficult to find out what they want. And without a... Uh, I suppose these free LEDs didn't come with any data sheet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They, have, they don't have any like serial numbers on them or anything. Either. Maybe these LEDs fell off the back of a van. It's easy because they're very small. <laughs> All right. Three seconds. Two, three. Touch and out. Uh, the dev board that we are using is the um, Wemo uh, D1. Yes. The we well, it says actually on here, yeah, it says Wemo D1 Mini. Mm -hmm. um, in the Arduino software, it's called the D1 something else, but the Wemo D1 Mini or D1 R1 in the in the Arduino software but seems to work. The silk screened on it is D1 Mini. All right, so we've got we've got a board. Is it correct? Is it reading on the software? 
Uh, okay, and according to offbeat, which? Okay. Assuming, so a two, assuming a two volt LED at 20 milliamps, we'd want about 65 ohm resistance. Which is way more than we have. Yeah, well, we've you've got like a, you've got a one kilo ohm resistor in there. Don't yeah, you? so we, yeah. Need, yeah. Uh, okay, so I will turn on D6. Okay. All right, D6 should now be on. Yep. And that's lit up a little bit? Yeah, yeah, a little bit there. And green the same way. So let's see what happens if we do it with a. It's a little bit brighter, but not much. So it's without any resistors at all. Yeah. And then if we reverse the voltage, what do we get here? What does it look like? So this is, so it's weird that it, it actually doesn't seem that much. You yeah. would think that, that it would be, that, that a, putting a one kilo ohm resistor would make more oh, of a difference. Oh, interesting. Oh, hey, that's nice and bright. Yeah, now that... Okay, and then, uh, so I guess maybe it's just the red that's, low, and then, hmm, interesting. So the green is all night. Yeah, it might just be that these are, these are low output red. All right, because that wouldn't make that sh shouldn't make any sense otherwise. Different LEDs use different current and voltage, I guess. But I mean, it seems odd that you would consider. Obviously, you would be using the LED in the same thing. You would want it to be the same. Yeah, they usually range from one point nine to two point one. Hmm. Yeah, it's corrupt drop barriers. Also, right, they could just be defective. You know, it could be that I uh, the this wouldn't be the first time. Could be that Corey was correct and I ended up overheating the LED and causing it damage. Oh, no. No, that would just cause it to not work? Yeah, basically. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's pretty obvious if, if it's just, like, not working. Oh. <laughs> Roy Eltham it makes an interesting posit. That the degree of different voltage levels need different resistors. But you were trying it without any resistors. Yeah. There. And even there. So let's... Uh, You've got a third one that you haven't soldered that you can test against as and well. And we will. We have a couple here. Yeah. So this might be good to check just to make sure the LED is not just busted, just hooped. Okay. So let's get that on the ground wire. Green so looks green's good. Green's good. And flip it over. Red is dim. Red is dim on that one too. Okay. How about this last one here? Without any resistors, it should at least light up for a bit before exploding. Yep. Red is dim. And green is bright. All right. All right. Well, well we can make things green. <laughs> well, you know what this tells me, Paul, is that the, uh, the software sound. The software sound. The concept works. And uh, My part works fine. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> wow, you know, I, I've just had a bad day here today so far. I'm going to make a case. Nope. It's, I mean, it's interesting with this, like I was saying with the, you know, the, the, the process of, of coming to make the, the tally light thing. Mm -hmm. There, you know, I, I did a lot of research into, uh, into different ways of doing the, you sort of get down into, you kind of go down the rabbit hole of like, okay, I can't, you know, trying to, it's like, okay, so this, this SDI system that the black magic cameras use to control the thing, what's the protocol for that? And then, and which is, it's documented. Like black magic is actually pretty good in that they've actually like documented the protocol. Mm -hmm. It's written in the, like they write the stuff in the headers of the, of SDI video frames, right? Is how it because it's also sending SDI video back to the camera, um, and so you know, like for a second, I was like, okay, so how would I have to do to make that work? And I was like, no, there's no way, I can. <laughs> you know. But but the, the sort of process, it's like, okay, well, I can't do it that way, but maybe I can do it this way. Um, another thing that I wanted to do was 
um, right now, so right now these there's a central server, um, which is actually on the streaming computer right now, mm -hmm. um, that controls every that sort of coordinates everything. It contact it, it, it's the thing that is sending the uh, uh, that 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 they're all talking to in order to get the whether to light up or not. And it also connects to the ATEM to uh, to learn to learn when the ATAM changes channels so it can right. light them up appropriately. My original, again, my original thought was that these all have Wi-Fi. The ATAM system connects to the network. I could just have all these guys independently talk to the ATAM and they could just do their, and they, it would be almost like a little like mesh network. Mm -hmm. There wouldn't need to be a central server, which would be handy because then you don't have to have a, you could like take them into the field and you yeah. wouldn't have to have a centralized server to operate everything. Uh, but again, you run into these things where it's like it turns out uh, people have done various tests with this, and it turns out the ATEM is not happy connecting to like five different systems <laughs> all at the same time. It tends to crash out. So, so you have to be some small. Uh, it's server. A, it's a process. You know, you have to. It's better to have a server than send things out. So, you know, the 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 process of of learning about what capabilities the different pieces that you're trying to stick together are is always interesting. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, what I'm interested the, the so that the the like the LEDs that you have there, the little the little yeah, just like guys. single color ones. Yeah. Um do we know if those work at all? Well, I mean Is we, there any way to just can we, can we just like power one up? There is actually a very easy way to do that. And we can just uh connect from ground to one of either the 3.3 or 5 volts. And uh, if I remember correctly, I think the long end is the uh, is the negative terminal on these. Uh, oh, okay, wait a second. GPIO can often be set to pull up or pull down depending on if you need sync on source. Uh, set to pull up or pull down depending on if you need sync. Yeah, well, I think that's... Um, uh, That's like, is that right now, like the pin mode is set to output right now rather than input? I think, isn't that what? I think that's what they're sorry, saying. Sorry, we're, we're. Yeah, we're, 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 we're trying to. As opposed to, so, so for. Oh, that's not what we're talking about. Uh, getting the LED between the bolt and ground will almost we'll certainly fry, fry it. Okay. That sounds like a challenge to, no. Well, that's, I mean, that's something I've already done here with, with the resistor in place. If you just go in and hit touch the uh, the five volts connection there, you get the same sort of mm. like almost exactly the same brightness that you're getting. Oops, I've turned it off. Uh, <laughs> well, like you use the multimeter on the board anyway, so you know what D five and D six are outputting. Anyways. Yeah, exactly. They're 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 putting out six point five volts. Right, which, which is, is weird. Which is neither five volts nor considering with the multimeter, volts. the five volt was also putting out like ten volts too. Maybe your multimeter is just doubling everything I'm gonna, for some reason. I'm actually going to have to give this uh, <laughs> this multimeter a test with my other one at home and see if it, it might just be out. But, yeah. And GPIO, everyone's saying the GPIO pins putting out 6.5 is very wrong. So, yeah, I think this just might be... Is it, is it, yeah, is, is it's always the... The, the the question is like is the whole setup wrong or is the thing yeah. you're using to measure the whole setup <laughs> if your ruler is off then right. you're going to have it, things might be this same size to each other but if you're working with someone else there's a great uh thing the in the right you know the right stuff like the the movie about uh the first stages of of, of space mm -hmm. travel uh there's this great scene where they're they're you know doing a launch stuff and they they get a red light on the board that something has gone wrong the first thing they have to do is phone their the other uh, mission control in in Australia. Oh uh, yes. To see whether the bulb is broken. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's like before we stop everything. Do we have confirmation? Do do we have cover? Are you guys also seeing this? Because it might be just that the bulb is messed up. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's be honest. The guy gave me these out of a bag. With uh, the bag was unlabeled. Everything was. 
check your, your, your multimeter against a known value, such as a wall outlet, assuming your meter is rated for it. That's not right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, okay, I mean, so the computer should be putting out 5 volts, right? I'm, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to test directly off the, uh, off the pads there. Uh, yeah, there's nothing else, I think, right now that we've got around here that I'm willing to. Battery? A battery could do it. Um, yeah, someone, yeah, just bring us, bring them to us a battery from the rechargeables. I just remember a bad, I had a bad time working, uh, plugging a multimeter into a wall once when I was much younger. Is that a thing, like, is that a thing that could happen to a multimeter that for some reason it was doubling all the, like, if there's some weird like, setting or? It shouldn't be. I don't know why you would ever want a setting in which everything was doubled. But. So, okay, these should so, be. And that's from, presumably that's from the, the, the charged. This is a charged battery, right, Matt? Yeah. Okay, so this should be getting about 2 point, or 1.2 volts then. You know, 23 or point. So it's wait. That doesn't seem right. One point three. Okay, that's right. Did I just have this in the wrong mode? That's still set to broadcast, right? Yeah. Or it's a, yeah. That sh that that pin should be live. I would Maybe. call that not a definitive answer. How about I go right to the pin source? So if you go over... Can I hold it? Or? Oh, that's all right. And... Right in. Source the pin. It was five... It was almost... Like, ooh. keeps dropping. Well, that's interesting. Try D5 for me. Or, uh, uh, all right, D5 should be live now. It'll go on for a bit and then just drop out. I mean, could the fact that we have all this other stuff hooked up to it at the moment? Shouldn't be because nothing's nothing's shorting it out. Shorting out. The wavy wavy V is AC mode. Straight V is DC. Mode. Yeah, that's I'm in DC mode, and I think that was my problem before. All right, well, get out of there. Something's wacky here. Check ground to 3.3 .3 as a known source. Multimeter is gaslighting you. I almost feel like that, you know? Okay, let's turn it to. Tw oh, that might be it. I might be overloading. Okay, 3.3 .3 is right. Okay. Okay. That's good. It's not. Five is actually putting out four point six four. Okay, that seems more correct. Hey. And D five is still on. D five should be on. Yeah. Okay. Three point three. Three point three volts. Ha! Yay. Okay. <sighs> We've proven that this is operating correctly, and that apparently there's a setting on the multimeter yes. that just doubles everything. And I also, yeah, now I know how to use a single bit. Why okay. do we even have that switch? All right, so that means that uh, we know that these keep them in voltage when you store it, as amperage is a dead short. Okay. Oh, so it was in AC mode before. Yeah, in voltage measurement and not amperage measurement. 
This is always like whenever I see people using multimeters, it's always like like there seems to be a bunch of things that look identical on the <laughs> on the on the dial. Well, this one's not great at at, uh, at, at labeling the different sections too, mm. because you've got your section here, which is your your AC voltage, and that's just this area here. Oh, it's not. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, I actually had it in. Just looking at it now, I had it in amperage mode to check oh, amperage. Those little ticks are the different. Oh, yeah, they they're they're not uh, they're not markations. They're delineators between sections. Wow. Yeah. That yeah. is that that is poor uh, uh, information design. Yeah. But but for it has poor affordances. But for your information, say. down here, uh, this is the scale of. Uh, what the scale it can read at. So if you have it down here, your max value is going to be 200 right. uh, milliamps, and then two, or 200 millivolts, two volts, and then 20 volts would be your maximum there. So right. that's why I had, when I had it in two and it was maxing out and just said one with no decimals, I'm like, oh, right. okay. That means that it's it was maxed out. Right, right. Got to go up. All right. Yeah, exactly. Lord Hosk. Multimeters are a lot of that doesn't work. Click. That doesn't work. Click. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Everything's great. Yeah, okay. Reading the meter does not necessarily explain the meter. <laughs> so I think that means um, what we're going to have to do is find some LEDs that it, that are, uh, com I guess, compatible with this. Yeah. So from from what you, I mean, obviously from that little diagram that that guy made, and like from your ex from what you understand, mm -hmm. theoretically there should be enough oomph in this to power. Some sort of LED. Exactly, and Roy Eltham actually uh, points out uh, for us that they work around 3.4 volts for forward footage voltage, and red ones work at 1.2 to 2.4. So, for whatever reason, these seem to be particularly hungry red. Like the green was not too bad, but the red ones seem to be very hungry. And it might have something to do with the design of a multi uh, LED. I honestly don't mm. know because this is actually my first time working with it. And theoretically, like I mean, theoretically, we have the pins that we could do. We could easily do two LEDs, mm -hmm. and with that that little uh, flying saucer thing, so yeah. you could cut it coming out both sides. It could or something. be a lot easier that way. That means that uh, yeah, I, I think what we've learned here today, if we are allowed to learn things, is uh, when you're buying parts, make sure you get a data sheet. Maybe maybe don't get your parts from some guy in the back alley. <laughs> I believe you now, Dark Morford. Yeah, data sheets are important. And with that, I think we've probably exhausted what we can do with today's episode here. All right. Yeah, so this is, I guess this was a little bit more of a, uh, a show and tell yeah. uh, in some ways. Um, but yeah, anyway, it's one of these things that hopefully, if theoretically, if we can get this kind of going in the way that I want it to, uh, you know that thing that happens uh, often, especially... Uh, 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 Friday Night Paper Fight can be very bad for it um, because, you know, when, when they're playing the game that their camera is the camera across from them. But then, of course, when we cut to the wide, that cam they have, they're talking yeah. that way. Maybe, I'm not, I'm not guaranteeing this because people might not pay attention to it, but theoretically, if we can get these going, then it'll be more obvious when people will be like, oh, hey, I'm supposed to look at this camera now. Hi, camera. <laughs> So that, I think we're going to draw today's episode to a close. And I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us today as we uh, stumbled our way through uh, not quite a build, but at least a proof of concept. And uh, thanks to uh, Anonymous Cheer for the uh, uh, 4,000 bits. Good gosh, yes, thank you. That is an amazing amount. And we... it, took, it took me a while before I realized that there wasn't just somebody called an anonymous gifter who was incredibly... Uh, uh, generous. Mm -hmm. that, somebody, that somebody just didn't have like their username be an anonymous gifter. Oh, you mean it is actually an anonymous gifter? Yeah, the, 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 there's someone who has chosen not to put the. It's not just. Wow. Some, okay. It, 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 that isn't just somebody who is very uh, generous. I thought it was a, cle a clever username for someone who likes to give out <laughs> gifts. But... <laughs> well. Thank you, an anonymous uh, cheerer, and thank you to uh, the the named cheers and subscribers as well. We appreciate everyone who comes by here to either just hang out in the chat and watch, or 
chat along or try to give us uh, help. But yeah. yeah, it's it's always very interesting. I love even when you know when I'm working on tech or whatever here. Uh, it's amazing. No matter what you're, when, no matter what you're working on, uh, there'll always be not only people who who can like help in the chat, but somebody be like, oh yes, I was a person working in that field for the last 15 <laughs> years. <laughs> or, yes, these three other people are also Naomi to arcade board owners who have yes. had a problem with the chip. <laughs> so I'm really happy to have all of you uh, with us here for these programs. But we'd like to specifically uh, recognize some people for their subscription, starting with Zalbag, who has been here for 16 months. Thank you. Colonel Craner for two years. Thank yeah. you very much. Big thanks to Miark, who has been here for 52 months. Wow. Mola Molefant for eight months. That's a great hybrid. I am Morthos, and you have been here for 28 months. Steel Fox 13 for 17 months. Big ups to Zed Arthen, who's been here for 27 months. Thank you so much. Uh, Dex Roll Crit Fail for two months. And thanks to Immoral Ethicist, who's been here for 29 months of immoral behavior. P. Black Coat. Black P. Coat. P. Black Coat. For 20 months. Thank you very much. Mr. Polly K. has been here for 17 months. Thank you for your continued support. Morden the Solace Sings for 14 months. Mm. Gets longer every time. Freedent has been here for 25 months. Thank you for your support. Quicksil 102 for two years. Thank you very much. Good anniversary and a good anniversary to Stephen GR123. He's been here for an odd number of months. Seven. Thank you. That is a very strange number of months. <laughs> True Thorn. Accept no substitutes for 30 months. And Aitsu 100 has been here for three months. Suitably epic. For 63 months, a suitably epic number of months. Indeed. Our Brew has been here for their second months. Thank you for coming back. Gormless Ben for 38 months, also known as Normal Ben. <laughs> Evil Spoons, 983, here for 11 months. Nightbook One for one whole year. Hello. Nightbook One, thank you for being here for a whole year. And hello to Waterboy99 Troop, who's a brand new subscriber. Welcome. Burgor Teraf for 27 months. Thank you very much. I'm already taxed too much on my burgers, but these bits will help. <laughs> Colonel Kreiner also there, but also eBlock Type. One, Earthen One, an anonymous cheer, Roy Eltham and Xanto69 all contributed to those 4,351 bits, the bits, the bits. <sighs> Corey, what do we have coming up in the week? Nothing. Dark <laughs> Void. <laughs> Despair. The end of things. <laughs> One moment, please. It's possible they didn't set that up properly. Yeah. That's all right. Oh, my. Uh, coming up tomorrow, I know, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. is Friday Night Paper Fight, where we're going to be doing uh, something kind of fun. Uh, it's called uh, Oathbreaker. Oathbreaker. Which is a format of magic that is uh, something that people just uh, some people just came up with, and they tweeted about it, and it looked kind of fun. So it is not like an official format or anything, but uh, it's it sounds super neat. It's like Commander uh, in that it's a four-player game with uh, singleton decks, so uh, uh, one card, one of each card type, or w maximum one of each card. Uh, but they're sixty-card decks, and they're one hundred uh, sixty-card decks instead of a hundred-card decks, and you only get twenty life. So theoretically, it's going to be a little bit quicker. Mm -hmm. You're instead of a Commander, you have a Planeswalker. Mm -hmm. And the planeswalker has a special spell. A so signature spell. A signature spell. So like instead of commander where you just have your commander, this is you've got your planeswalker and your planeswalker signature spell that you can cast whenever you want, but it costs two extra every time mm -hmm. you cast it. So it should be interesting. Um, it's going to be Ben and Cam and 
Serge and uh, James. Ooh, and so, they're all they're all brewing their own decks. Uh, yes, except for James. Yeah. I think Ben is doing James. James is a busy boy, but that's going to be really interesting. And of course, if I recall, we have Adam's Game House happening on Saturday. Uh, no, because he's out of town. Then we do not have the Adam's Game House. We uh, do not have Adam's Game House, but we do have Rhythm Cafe. That is the next one coming up. Yes, chip tune something or other. Uh, delicious chip tune something, something or other. other. It's a game. It's 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 rhythm, and it's going to be fun. I'm going to enjoy it. And then, uh, yeah, keep an eye on the schedule because uh, starting next week. Things are going crazy oh, yes. in the sense that they're different. Temp source points out there are 25 hours left in the current schedule. Right. Official stream schedule actually starts with uh, uh, the new schedule officially starts with Rhythm Cafe at the same time as it was in the previous schedule. Yes. But we're starting it on the Sunday because it's starting on March 31st, not April 1st. Yes. It's not an April Fool's joke. Nope. We would never do that to you. But what is happening is on Monday, I'm going to start uh, playing Yoshi's Crafted World, which is a part of our new show uh, called Play It Forward, which mm -hmm. is a long play show uh, in the sense that it is, I'm going to be playing through the whole game uh, in three hours, not all at once, but in, uh, over the course of the week. So uh, we're bringing back the idea of, of trying to play, trying to show, show off more games the whole way through rather than just uh, little teasers that like what we do on, uh, you know, uh, New Day, uh, or, New Day or, or, or uh, uh, 18 Games and Counting or, or the, the Games of Chance. We thought it would be better to actually show things off better. So bringing back the long form content. So and yeah, check out. I think someone was saying that the events page has actually been updated now mm -hmm. uh, and or LearningRayRun.com slash live has the new schedule. Keep an eye on that. We'll be trying to tweet about it and stuff, too, so make sure you know where all the new stuff is. And, of course, you can always find all the shows, both pre-recorded and streamed in general, over at loadingreadyrun.com for links to everything. And we'd like to thank, of course, everyone who chose to support us over at patreon.com slash loadingreadyrun. And those of you who chose to subscribe here at, at twitch.tv slash loadingreadyrun, that's where we live. So thanks so much, everyone, once again for joining us. This ends today's broadcast day here. Thanks so much for watching Ever Forward. Never learning. Also, a thank you to Anonymous Gifter for gifting Doodles the Great a new subscribing. Thanks, Good Doodles, night. for being around. Good night. <laughs>